And uh, I thank God for all of my uh, KLI students and those of you who join us here on, on, on Wednesday uh, nights because with, I don't know if you realize or not, but you're KLI students also. And so we, we, and, and we echo what Janie said about our Thursday night class. We, that, that class has, has some very special people in it, and we so enjoy that time. So if, you, if you're interested in that, you can call the church office. You can speak with Bethany, and she'll tell you more. We have a, in fact, we're ending a course, and we're going to start another course uh, around the third week in January. So if you want specifics of that next course that we'll be starting, you can call the church office, and you can speak with Bethany, and she'll be glad to fill you in on that next course that's coming up. Amen? Amen. Now, we're in the, the letter uh, to the Philippians, and this is a letter. And what we are doing, we're studying the Bible by um, what, what you would call the Methodist expository study, which means that we're going verse by verse on purpose. And so what we're doing, we're covering each verse in the Scripture. And what this does, it allows us to have more of a clear overall understanding of God's word and what God is saying. So we get to see the entire book. One of the challenges, somebody was asking me today earlier about a particular belief. Somebody, a Christian had a belief in a certain area and they were asking me, uh, why do these people believe in this way? And I said to them, the reason why we get off in our belief in regards to God's word is when we take just a piece of the word of God. And we, what happens is you take a piece of something and you base your entire understanding on just a piece. And see, when you do that, what happens is, is that you, 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 you're clouded in your view. And so what God wants you to do is he, he wants you to take the full counsel of this word. What does that mean? It means that if I believe something from the word of God, it has to be uh, tapered and measured in regards to all what God's word says about that subject. You see what I'm saying? And so what that does when I do that is that it allows me to see more clearly a clear a view of what God is saying on that um, particular subject. And I don't just walk away with just a little piece of an understanding. Isn't that good? Yes. yes. Now, we're in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to pick up because I don't want us to spend all year in Philippians. I mean, it is so rich sometimes. You can, I could easily do that, but, but we need to move on, so I'm going to try and do, do that more tonight. We're, I've entitled this Men of Gold because in this particular passage that we're going to look at tonight, it's going to deal with um, the fact of these two men, two men in the Scripture, and, and the Lord is going to show us something by way of his Spirit and his Word as to how he appraises men you'll find out that God does not appraise men the way the world appraises men. And so that's going to help us see that. So we're going to pick this up uh, in verse 19, verse 19. Uh, and it says, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about him. This is the, uh, happens to be the, the New International Version. So that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Verse 20, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now what we see here is that Paul, he's writing uh, this letter to the Philippians, this church that he so loves. And in this letter, as you... When you read this letter, if you really pay attention, what, what's happening here is that you're seeing the heart of a pastor. Paul was an apostle, but the fivefold ministry gifting encompasses the pastoral office. And so you're seeing the heart of a pastor, which is really the heart of God for the church. Now, see, this is going to be very important to us because if you are a member of the body of Christ, you are very, 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 very important to God. God cares very much about his church. And, 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 and one of the things that we are going to see here is just how much, God, how much God cares about his church. And we're going to see it through the lives of these men. So in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 2, uh, he's talking about Timothy. Timothy, uh, you understand, of course, that if you are familiar with the New Testament, we have First and Second Timothy. And as, as you read the references on Timothy, what you find is that Timothy was a spiritual son of Paul. Paul met him. 
and begin to grow up him up in the ministry. And now we see that Paul, when in regards to the Philippian church, is mentioning uh, Timothy. Now I want you to look with me. Here's some notes that I made in regards to verse 19. Note Paul's great concern for the Philippians. He wants accurate verification as to how they are actually doing, the state of the church. Now, here's the thing. What we see here is that the Apostle Paul, he's saying that I'm going to send Timothy to you. For what purpose? Because I want to know exactly how the church is doing. Now, what does that mean? It means that the, the pastoral heart is a heart that cares very much for the sheep. Now, a, a, a fair question would be, how does God care about the sheep? What's the pastoral heart in regards to the church? Here's some ideas. First of all, are they strong and committed to Jesus? What does God want for his church? He wants every member in that church to be strong and committed. Now, let's, let's break that down a little bit. What does that mean, to be strong and committed? It means that if I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm a follower of him, that there is a passion in me for God. Does that make sense to you? Amen. It means that I have a heart and I have, there's a driving compulsion in me to want to please God. Listen to me. And I have to be careful because I'll start preaching. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching. But here's the thing. I was talking to somebody earlier this morning about this subject. When a person has a genuine passion for God, they may be a, 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 a quiet type of person from the standpoint of their personality, but there is, there is something that emanates from that person. You can tell if somebody is serious about God. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. If you've ever been around somebody, and I'm not talking about somebody who's trying to be super spiritual. I'm just talking about if somebody really has a heart for God, <laughs> you can tell it. The, the, the way, the, their demeanor reveals that. The way they, obviously their decisions will reflect that. But, but I'll tell you this, I've, I've observed this. Somebody who really has a heart for God, they can be in their work environment. And that one person, they can be in the midst of a, a let's say a group of people, and they 40 or 50 people that work in a particular area. That person's heart about God, for God, will have an, an effect on that entire environment. Have you ever seen that? Amen. Now listen, a person who doesn't have a heart for God, they will be weak in their conviction for the things of God. And what that weakness will do, it will not affect anybody. Do you hear what I'm saying? If somebody has a heart for God, they can walk into an environment, and you can tell there's something about them. It emanates, even before they even say anything, it emanates from them. And so what Paul is asking here, he's saying this, I'm going to send Timothy because I want to know, is the church strong? Are they passionate about Jesus Christ? Is it, or is it, well, let me stay on the positive side. Do they want to please them? Is the church moving in that direction? Here's another idea. Have they been impacted by false teaching? Now, you'll find that in the letters of Paul specifically, because if you, if you follow, he wrote, about thir he wrote 13 books that we know of in the New Testament, 14 if you count Hebrews. We're not, we're not sure about Hebrews, so we won't be dogmatic about that. But in his writings, what you'll find, this reoccurring theme in regards to false teaching. Why is that so important? Because here's the thing, one of the things that is most deadly to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is what? False teaching. Because if people absorb false teaching, what it will do is that it will lead them away from Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? That's serious, isn't it? So therefore, this pastoral heart would be very concerned as to how does the church stand. Because here's the thing, in every, in every period of time in regards to the history of the church, uh, in, in our day as well as any other day, the church has always been threatened by false teaching. You take, for instance, in, in China, the nation of China, for decades there's been a tremendous revival going on in China. China in the 1950s had about, oh, about a million believers. Today, China has something like over 100 million believers. That's tremendous growth, isn't it? And this is in the 1950s. This is the, the missionaries were kicked out. 
because of what happened with Mao Zedong and, and, the, and the takeover of the communists and all that kind of thing. And so the, the missionaries were kicked out. And so many thought, well, the church in China is going to die. But the church went underground and did not die, but exploded. But do you know one of the greatest challenges that the church in China has? They have the challenge with false teaching. Now, now some of that is the result because they do not have, in, many, in some respects, the abundance of the word of God, and they do not have pastors who have been effectively trained to teach the people. And so, therefore, people are more uh, susceptible to false teaching. But false teaching will always destroy, hurt, slow down, hinder the church. It's very important what doctrine people receive. So Paul would be concerned. Do you see what I'm saying? He would be concerned. How is the church in regards to false teaching? How is the church faring? Have they been, are they walking in love toward one another? Here's, here's one of the basic characteristics uh, and, and fundamentals that the church has to be engaged in. The church has to do what? Walk in love toward one another. Because if the, if the local community of faith, faith is not walking in, in love towards one another. What do you have? You have the situation that you had in, in the Corinthians. You have division. You have people uh, uh, striving against one another. And here's the thing. Can the Spirit of God work in an environment like that? Not at all. So he would be concerned as to whether or not the, the believers are walking in love. Now what does this say to us? Because here's how you study the Bible. Remember, you always go to the text, what is written, and you look at what it is written, what it is saying to the people who were there first, correct? Is that right? Because context rules, correct? So you go into the text and you see what is, and so that's what we're doing. We're looking at what is Paul saying to the Philippians, correct? Now, if we get that right, then we can apply what he's saying to the Philippians, that church, to us. Does that make sense to you? Right? Because if whatever God had to say to the Philippians, guess what? That's exactly what he has to say to the church here in San Antonio. Does that make sense to you? All right, very good. You're awake. Good. Uh, here's, another, here's another point. Are they active? Because, and these are just points, because what does he really ask? What is Paul asking? I want to know, is the church at Philippi healthy? Are they healthy? How can you tell whether a church is healthy. Here's another way. Are they actively involved in fulfilling the Great Commission? Why would that be important? Because that's the last thing Jesus told the church to do. Amen. So, so if, I'm, if, I'm a, if I am a believer, one of the priorities of my life should be what? Sharing the gospel. That's why we have a missions program here. That's why we're reaching out uh, over uh, in different parts of the world. That's why we have training and teaching so that we're, we're not just going to reach out all over the world. We're also going to reach out in, in areas where we are, for instance, where we have influence in our workplace and in our neighborhoods and areas where we get to share with people and interact with people. We want to be able to share, correct? Why? Because every believer has this mandate on them to do what? Share the gospel. So one of the indications of a healthy church is does that church has an emphasis on sharing the gospel. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So it's not just getting a bunch of bodies in a room, right? Yes. That, that doesn't prove a healthy church. Yes. No. Are they walking in love? Are they, are, they, are, they, uh, are they clear on their doctrinal teaching? Are they fulfilling the great commission? So Paul is asking, I want to know how the church at Philippi is doing. So these are some indications or indicators as to how the church is faring. All right, you're still awake. Okay. So we have the, the true heart of our pastor. He's concerned. And here's the thing, here's the thing. This idea you see in this apostle, this heart of the pastor for the church, the pastor has a love for the body, a love. And you see this coming through. Now, what does this mean? It means that pastors should have a love for the body, correct? 
I was watching Pastor Flowers up here this morning, and you'll see, and you'll notice he, before he goes back with the leaders, he has a natural, almost a natural compulsion to share some tidbit of truth with you and to encourage you before he goes off. What is that? That's the pastoral heart. Right? Why? Because, see, the pastor's heart loves the sheep. He wants to build up the sheep. He wants to encourage the sheep. There are times he has to weep with the sheep. He has to walk alongside the sheep. That's the heart of a pastor. And see, that's why it's so important to have a pastor in your life, correct? Amen. Right? Yeah. Because here's the thing, here's the reality. There are points and times in all of our lives that we walk through difficulty. Yeah. We walk through challenges. Yeah. And we need somebody who has the heart of God to be there with us, Right? I mean, listen, if, if somebody has an evangelistic type of calling and they stand in their office, they're not going to be your pastor, right? They'll come in and they'll, they'll evangelize, but they're going to the next location, correct? Because that's their calling. But a pastor, he's there with the people, correct? He's there with them. He's sharing with them. So that's what you see here. Even though Paul, he's, he's, he's in incarceration, but his heart is for the church at Philippi. And we see that, that his heart uh, portraying that. You still away? Amen. Now let's look at verse uh, 20. He says this in regards to Timothy. He says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Now, that's a bombshell of a statement to me. Because Paul is saying, he's saying that Timothy is a rare man. He's saying that Timothy is one of many, one of a kind of a man that has the heart for the sheep that I have. Obviously, Timothy is his spiritual son, son in the ministry, but he's saying he has the heart like I have. He's special. And that's why I entitled this Men of Gold, because what we see in Timothy, that, and we see Paul describing it, he has a genuine interest in your welfare. That speaks volumes. Among that, he's also saying at the same time, Timothy is not concerned. He doesn't put himself above the sheep, God's people. He puts God's people first. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 21. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. What is he saying there? He's saying that there are people who parade in ministry, and in reality, they really do not have a heart for the people of God. He's saying for every, now, that's, that's a pretty strong statement, wouldn't you think? He's saying for, for every, he's saying that, in other words, he's saying a whole lot of people do not care for the people of God. Right. <laughs> That's quite a statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you were to ponder that and kind of meditate, why in the world would he say such a statement? Well, here's one reason. Because back in the first century, guess what? You had a lot of people parading around as ministers, teachers, pastors, that really did not have the interest of God's people as a priority. And see, sometimes you, you, it's, that may be hard for you to tell that. But here's the thing. Paul is saying, you can tell that Timothy has that. How? Because he's been proven. Look, in the next verse there, verse 22. Uh, uh, let, let me just read this note here that I put down. Note the outstanding appraisal that Paul gives to Timothy. Timothy is a rare man in regards to his pastoral heart. He shares the same passion, love, and concern for the Philippians as Paul does. Timothy exemplifies the God kind of love which is concerned about others rather than themselves. On the contrary, many in ministry were concerned about themselves first rather than the church. And you understand the church, when we say church, it's not a building, is it? It's the people. So he's saying that there, there are people that were not concerned about the people of God. They were more concerned about themselves. And Paul is bearing this out. This is in the first century. Yeah. Let's something. We're now in the 21st century, correct? Right. 
do you think the same statement that Paul said in regards to the first century would apply in the, in the, in the 21st century? Yes. Do you think that there are many people that, that, that are exploiting the people of God and not really having a genuine interest in the people of God? Do you think that's the case? Yes, yes it is. See, this is why it is so critically important that when you have a good church and you have someone like Pastor Flowers who's, who's a genuine individual, how do you know he's a genuine individual? Because he has a long history of consistency. You see what I'm saying? So we need to thank, oh, thank God for that. Thank God for that. And this is what Paul is saying about Timothy. This man has a, he has a record. He's been proven. Let's look at verse 22. Are you still away? Yeah. He, he, he goes on to talk about Timothy, but ye know the proof of him. Now, I slipped the King James in here on you, okay? Just in case you didn't know. So Pastor Files can't talk about me. I did slip the King James in here. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the what? Gospel. Now, here's that word proof. The Greek word there is dokame. Do you see that? And what does it mean? It means a test of somebody, whether or not somebody is trustworthy. It's a test. So, what is he saying in regards to Timothy being proof? He's saying that Timothy has been tested. Now, how do you test somebody in regards to trust? You test trust over time and experience. Now, we could say a whole lot here, but let me say this to you. That's why when it comes to people who are in leadership in the church, how, how do you come up with leadership in the church? People have to be tested over extended periods of time. How else? You test them, you prove them, you observe them over extended periods of time. And the extended periods of time, what does that mean? Their actions, their demeanor, their decisions over an extended period of time does what? Proves whether or not they are trustworthy. Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen to me, listen. Paul is saying here that trust is not something that you just give. Trust has to be earned. How do you earn trust? You earn trust over time and experience. So, you know, somebody who just blows in here and they got a whole lot of charisma, a whole lot of bombast, and a whole lot of vehemence, and they just can do everything. They swing from the chandeliers and, whoa, boy, weren't we impressed? No, 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 trust. We want to observe you. We want to see you in different situations. We want to see you over an extended period of time. We want to see you walk through some difficulty. How do you act? We want to see you with some pressure on you. We want to see you when things are not going great. How do you act then? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? That establishes trust. Yeah. Just because you have the goods, as they say, <laughs> the goods don't mean you can be trusted. That's right. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, what does that say? It says this. In the context of those who are going to serve God's people, there has to be a dimension of trust that, is, has, to, that has to be established. And that trust is, you can't establish trust over just a moment. Did you know that? Yeah. Somebody walks up to me and says, uh, don't you trust me? Well, how can I trust you? I don't even know you. Yeah. How can I trust you? Right. No, trust has to be proven over time. Experiences. Yeah. Habitual. Yeah. What has this person done over time? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I hope, I hope you're, you're beginning to see that this whole idea of somebody serving in regards to ministry is not just the fact somebody just walks in and starts, well, you know, he's got the goods. He just, no, 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 no. In the kingdom of God, there has to be this establishment of trust over time. So Paul is saying this. He brings this up. Timothy has been proven over time. He served with me in the ministry. I've observed his life. I've observed his walk. I've observed what he's done day in and day out. He's been proven. He's been proven. 
Trust is not given. Trust is earned. That makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if, if, I'll tell you, if, if, we, if we were to use that particular uh, uh, standard, in many cases in our life, we, we would stay out of trouble. Did you know that? Yes. If you would, if you would, <laughs> if you would watch the people you let in your life and not just let anybody in there because they talk good, watch who you let into your inner uh, council, you would save yourself a lot of heartache in life. Okay. Now, that was verse 22. Let's, let's move down. He says in verse 22, But I know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So here, here's what Paul is saying. Timothy is the closest thing to me. I'm going to send him. Now, he also says this. I hope that I myself will be able to come to you. That's my expectation. But in the meantime, I'm going to send Timothy. Why? Because he has the heart I have. And whatever he says, I can trust him. His words have weight with me. I can trust him. I can trust him. Um, look at verse 25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Can you say Epaphroditus? Epaphroditus. Oh, that's a good word, isn't it? <laughs> that, that name means, it, by the way, that, the, his name means the lovely one. It has to do really with the going back to the Greek goddess uh, um, Aphrodite. And that's the, the original point for his name, but his name means to be one, one who's lovely. He, go, he says here, I, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Here's another man of gold. Notice how Paul describes him. My brother, my fellow worker, a fellow soldier who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. What is he saying about Epaphroditus? He's saying, first of all, he, has, he, he knows this man. Now, when did he meet Epaphroditus? That's a good question, isn't it? He met Epaphroditus when he was in Philippi, right? Because we know from this verse that Epaphroditus is where? He's from Philippi. He's actually from the church at Philippians. He is a Philippian. And so while Paul was there in that time period, he met this man. Now, here's the thing about Ephrodotus that he says he, he makes. No, he says, you sent him to take care of my needs. Now, what does that say about Ephrodotus? Here, here, it says a few things. Here's one of the things it says. The church at Philippi highly regarded and respected Ephrodotus. He had stature. Now, how did he get that stature? He earned the trust of that body. That's right. And so what happened was they sent him with the donations to take to Paul. Now listen, you don't give your money to just anybody and send them off, right? Because you, if you give your money to some people, it, it would never get to his destination, correct? Right. So they had to know this man. Amen. Here's another point. That, that word messenger, do you see that word messenger there? Let's move that. that word messenger, it's actually the word that we recognize, apostle. Now, here's the distinction that we need to make in this word. It doesn't mean the office of the apostle. In this particular case, it has to do with the general um, uh, vernacular as to how that word was used. Because in that day and time, in the Greek language, if you sent somebody somewhere, they were what? An apostle. If you sent them on Aaron, if you sent them to the store, they would be what? An apostle. You see what I'm saying? So that's what he's talking about in this case with Ephroditus. He's saying he was one who was sent by the church. You sent him to me. Are you with me? Yeah. So his name means a loving one. He, has a, he was a native of Philippi and sent to the apostle from the church of Philippi. He was highly esteemed in the church because they chose him to represent them in helping Paul. He was highly trusted by the church. 
See, one of the things I hope you see in these two men, in Timothy and Ephroditus, here's the thing. These men were men of gold from the perspective of God. These men were men that God, God uh, 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 favored because their lives was a life where they were what? They were more concerned about the church than they were themselves. Notice what it, what it, what it goes on to say about Ephroditus. There in verse, after, in verse 26, he says, For he longs for you, he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Notice, he was ill, and who's he concerned about? The church. He's concerned about them because they heard he was ill. He's concerned that they're overstressed, they're overburdened, they're too much, con too, uh, too concerned about him. He's concerned about the, doesn't that tell you something about this man's heart? He wasn't like, oh, me, me, it's all about me, I'm hurt, no, me, poor me. No, no, no. He was concerned because he didn't want to be a burden on them. He didn't want their hearts hurting because what he was going through. His concern was for them. What does this say about people that God chooses in regard to leadership. He's saying this, true leaders of God, those who God has called and, and are walking humbly before them, they would be more concerned about the people than they would themselves. Do you see that? Amen. Now, come on, that's, it's not that way in the world. <laughs> you know that. I mean, people walk right over you, yeah. step on you, push you out the way, roll you out the way, keep on going. Yeah, that's right. but, in the, but in the house of God, there's a care, because what, now what, what does this portray? Here it is. The love of God acts in what way? God loves is not a love that takes. It's a love that gives. The love of God that we, that we find in Scripture, this, this agape, that's, that's the word there in the Greek, agape. It, it is what God is. It gives. John 3, 6, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. The love of God always gives. Selfish love takes. So you see in these leaders, what do you see? You see the love of God. Giving. 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 Putting, here's another uh, characteristic of the love of God. Puts others first. Puts others first. There's a story of, you remember the Titanic back in the early part of the uh, around the 1920s, there about uh, that great British uh, voyage. It was a luxury liner, and it and it sunk. And some of the stories that came out of that, some over two about 2,000 people lost their lives. It was a horrendous thing. But it, but it talked about they only had just a few lifeboats. And you had people. And one on one hand, you had people that 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 they, they stayed on, the, on a sinking ship and encouraged others to get on the lifeboat. And then you had others that, that would actually try and push others off the lifeboat so that they can get in. And see, that's the picture of how you could do the church. You, you could be a person that you're concerned about only yourself. And what we see in these two men, these men of go, I call them, is the heart of God who is concerned about others first. Here, here's a litmus test for us. In my own heart, when, when I relate to the church, when I relate to life, who am I first concerned about? Am I only concerned about myself, my family? Or am I concerned about other people? And see, here, here's the thing. In, in relationships, when, when we, like for instance, if we're working here as a staff or something like that, am I only concerned about that which I'm doing? What about what somebody else is doing? You see what I'm saying? Because, see, the heart of God is what? Always concerned about somebody else. You see what I'm saying? That's the heart of God. So in relationships, I cannot be concerned when I'm dealing with you. It's not just me getting an advantage over you. No, I have to put you first. You see what I'm saying? Amen. I want to know, how can you get the advantage? You see what I'm saying? I yield to that. Yes, amen. That's the heart of God. The way of the world is opposite. 
And so what we see in these, in, in these particular brothers is this heart for God. Here we go. Um, in verse 27, indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. So you see again, Paul's, Paul's respect and honor and love for this brother, Epaphroditus. He said, if I had lost him, I, it would have hurt me. Why? Because this brother was such a rare breed. He goes on to say there, verse 28, Therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and may have less anxiety. What is he saying there? He said, now that Aphroditus has gotten well, he's, he's able to travel again, we're going to send him back to you. Why? Because we don't want you to be anxious and concerned about him. We want you to be able to rejoice. What, what is that? It's the heart of God. We want you to be able to rejoice in the fact that God has raised him up. So we're going to send him back to you. He goes on to say there in verse 29, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Now, what does that mean? Well, we don't know specifically what it means. Does it mean he overworked himself? That's a possibility. I'm, I'm not sure. But here's what we do know. is that Epaphroditus had the heart of God in him, and he was a man who was a giver. He put others first. And so, therefore, Paul says, look at the commendation Paul gives me. He says, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. In, in the kingdom of God, why do we honor people? We don't honor people because of their selfishness, do we? That's dishonor. We honor people because they serve and they love and they put others first. That's why we honor people. You see that? So, so as I close tonight, we, we did get through that chapter, didn't we? Praise God. We finally made it, huh? That's a tough one, huh? But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. What we see in these two men, first of all, is a heart of God whereby they put others first. They had a love for the people of God, the church of God, and they put the church first beyond themselves. And Paul, he praised them because of such a heart. He was, he was privileged to be in fellowship with such men. They were a blessing to his life. Now, what does that say about us? Because this is, that's context. So how do we make application? Here's the thing. It gives me a standard now on the attitude that I'm to have. I'm not to put my brothers and sisters last. I to be, I'm to be concerned about them. You see what I'm saying? When I deal in life, the love of God in me, and not just the brothers and sisters, also when I deal with the world, I'm not supposed to be doing things just to my advantage. You know, I don't want to sell somebody stuff, something that is hidden and cracked and broken. They don't know about it. Right? Because what is that? That's taking advantage of somebody, isn't it? Yes, it is. So my heart has to be, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to purposely do anything to hurt you. Now, because I'm a human, I, I can make mistakes, correct? And the Lord will forgive me if I repent. But I don't want to on purpose be the type of person I can do just anything to you and it doesn't bother me. Because the standard of God is that within the body of Christ, we love one another. And what does that mean? It means that we, we give first. We give first. Do you see the difference? between the church and the world. In the church, we give first. That's the love of God. Stand with me, please. As we close tonight, I, I, I trust you, you are able to see that from the hearts of these two men, Timothy and Aphroditus, being commended by the Apostle Paul as to their love for the body of Christ, and how they chose to put the body first before themselves. Now, here, here's, here's, a, here's a, we're in a, 
period of a season of the year, but a period of time where there's a lot of giving and things like that, sometimes within, from a worldly standpoint, a lot of the giving now is really from a selfish motivation. This would be a good time, I believe, to let the Holy Spirit just kind of, if, if need be, bring us back into proper perspective. What is this really about? It's about me being a believer, meaning that I'm a recipient of the love of God. And because I'm a recipient of that love, such great love, I become now a vessel of that love. And now I give that love to others. So it, as I make my decisions now, am, am I, am, am I going to be a person who's concerned about me? Or am I going to begin to practice putting somebody else first? Practice that. You see what I'm saying? Practice that. That's the heart of God. And if I'm a believer, guess what? The heart of God lives in me. I don't want to hide the heart of God. I don't want to cover it up. I want to let it emanate from me. Let it touch the lives of others. The heart of God. So just like Timothy and Aphrodite, I want to be that way. I want to practice that. Let's just, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to, to, if there are areas in our life and maybe perhaps there may be some relational issue that, that there's been a stalemate because we, we have not been able to kind of bridge the gap, let's just ask him to help us. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for showing us through your word such a marvelous, wonderful dis depiction of how these men so loved your body, loved the, your people, were examples of your love. Father, in the name of Jesus, the same spirit, Holy Spirit that lived in them now lives in us. Amen. And Father, we, we, we believe that we, we have the ability to practice love, Amen. to practice putting others first. To be healthy in our relationships and have a perspective where we practice it. Even when we don't feel like it. Even when others say we don't have to. But may we practice that. May we yield to the example of your holy word. In the precious name of Jesus. If you're so inclined, would you make this confession with me please? Would you say Lord Jesus... I thank you that according to your holy word, you now live in my spirit. Your word declares that the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit that has been given unto me. So I declare tonight that I have within me the capacity the ability to love so I choose to walk in love I am a recipient of your love therefore I am a giver of that which I have received I thank you for it in Jesus name come on somebody shout hallelujah glory to God thank you Lord Jesus Thank you for the love of God that lives within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You have yourself a blessed evening. And remember, next Wednesday will be our business meeting. It will start at 7 o'clock, and the focus will be on that particular meeting. God bless you. Amen.